Welcome to Live Town Hall. My name is Michael A. Charbon. My guest today is the Honorable Minister of the leading party of the government of Ontario. His name is Michael Coto, And Mr. Coteau is the Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services and Anti-Racism. And he's joining us for Live Town Hall. Live Town Hall is an interactive show. We encourage you to post your questions. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Michael Coteau. And that is spelled Coteau, C-O-T-E-A-U. And you can post your questions and we'll take your questions in amongst our discussion. Uh, we're going to post your questions and you can ask uh, Minister Coteau questions. A Anti-racism, uh, child services. We're going to talk a little bit about um, um, autism. We're going to talk about the TDSB. We're going to talk about this uh, excellent effort that uh, the Liberal government has just put forward. It's about $47 million to uh, combat anti-racism. A lot of things we're going to talk about. Um, first of all, just to give you a little bit of background here, um, he's been elected twice, first in 2011 and then second in 2014. He was Assistant Minister, minister to Tourism and Culture, citizen and, uh, Citizenship and Immigration, Minister of Tourism, responsible for Pan Am Games. And then in 2016, he added the responsibility of anti Anti-racism, and then in June, uh, the premier, Madam uh, Kathleen Wynne, uh, wanted him to be the minister of children and youth services. So this guy has been around. He's a very engaging gentleman. I had the opportunity to have a little chit chat before. <laughs> He's really a good guy, and worthwhile to take your questions and invest your time. Uh, please welcome the honourable minister of uh, children and youth services and anti-racism. Michael Coteau. Michael, thanks for having me here this evening. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Um, uh, again, I encourage you everything, Facebook, uh, everybody out there, Facebook uh, facebook.com forward slash Michael Coteau. So you can um, uh, join us and give your questions. I'm going to start off with $47 million. Yeah. Um, it's a huge announcement that uh, yourself and your, uh, and your governing uh, party announced. And it's quite an initiative that people feel is necessary and is uh, way late in the Arriving. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, the $47 million um, is uh, to add to our Youth Opportunities uh, Fund, and it's specifically uh, for uh, black youth in the GTA, Hamilton, Windsor, and uh, Ottawa. And uh, the money has been uh, put in place to, uh, to look for ways to reduce the disparities that exist. Uh, between uh, black youth and uh, and just the uh, the general public overall. When you say disparities, I mean, yeah. uh, there's going to be a bunch of words that we're going to come across. Reverse racism, systemic discrimination, social engineering, systemic barriers. We, we right. hear we hear these these words identifying uh, situational uh, occurrences in racialized communities right. that uh, experience them at a higher level than others. How are, how are you going to be able to apply this funding to make a tangible change in something that is very much societal and in certain instances, very under the rug, if one would say? Racism right. is a very personal thing. Yeah, well, the, the $47 million specifically is uh, in regards to youth programming. Uh, the anti-racism directorate budgets only $5 million, mm -hmm. and that's specifically to look for ways to fight systemic racism uh, here in Ontario. I think the question that you know uh, you're getting at is, um, you know, how are we going to go out there and, and fight systemic racism and use that 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 money, that expertise, to look for ways to uh, to change the way you know things are in the province of Ontario? You know, in our pre-discussion, I I started off by saying Ontario is probably the greatest place on the planet to live. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, a wonderful place, great opportunities. I'm an immigrant. My uh, you know family came here when I was around uh, four. Uh, you know, I lived in a, a community that had some some challenges, um, but you know, I have the opportunity as an immigrant, as a black man, you know, to go off to university to uh, to well, look get at involved how well you've done. and to you've become done a minister. Good. So we we have a great country here, mm -hmm. right? But when we look at the numbers and we look at what's going on uh, in the general public, you know, when you have uh, you know overrepresentation in the in the youth and um, and adult justice system, underrepresentation into post secondary. When you're a black male, the unemployment rate is around 25%. Uh, if you're black male youth, uh, up to 29. Um, the, the number for youth in general is about 15.5%. Uh, and, and the uh, unemployment rate overall for the province of Ontario is, I think, around 5.6%, the lowest in 16 years. So there's some folks who are being uh, left out of the, um, the success of this province. Um, and there's disparities that exist. So, but haven't uh, we come so, such a far way? Look at where we are. Look, look at what's happened. When, when do we say that sometimes hard work begets 
success. It's not to say right. our opportunity has to be there too. And there is that, and, and I acknowledge right. that. But after a certain moment, when do you say that hard work begets and success? And it starts off before a young person uh, becomes an adult. So, uh, for example, the Children's Aid Society in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, you know, black youth, I believe, represent about 8% of the population in Toronto, but represent over 40% of uh, young kids who are in care. So, so it starts off at a just, very, oh, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I don't uh, mean to interrupt you, but no, that, no, no, that, no. That, that, that fact is a sad state of affairs. Regardless right. what color, what gender, what community, that is a sad state of affair that that community has more of a problem right. with child care than another community. It's not because they're black, it's because no. they have a harder time. How do we fix that instead of making it a black issue? Well, we start to make investments. Well, it's specifically, if you look at the numbers, it is a black issue. It's an indigenous issue. It's, a, it's an issue that affects communities in very different ways. You know, I always make reference to the fact, if you look at the Jane and Finch community, that, that one community, we spend as citizens around $68 million every single year on incarceration and policing of that one neighborhood. Yeah. That to me is a problem. You know, can't we take a piece of that amount and invest it into programming it's a to lower to lower those 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 numbers? Yeah. And so, at the end of the day, it's obviously better for the community, but it's also better for you as a taxpayer. There's a cost to standing still. If we continue mm -hmm. to do the things the same way we've always done, you know, uh, it's going to get worse. And I'll tell you this little fact. So, Carl James, who's a researcher at York University. He's looked at some of the numbers that have come out of uh, the uh, desegregated race-based data at the Toronto District School Board, and we know... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Say that race, again. Race-based data. Degasserated... Sorry. De 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 <laughs> you even have a problem. That's a good line. What? 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 what, what? Okay. He, no, so he, he, he looked at race. Okay. <clears throat> collected information right, on data. race. So we know every generation of black, um, the next generation, so there's a third generation that came in the 60s, some in the 80s, but... Yep. So by the time you hit third generation in Ontario as, as a black um, person, every generation, the young people are getting worse. Mm. So the longer you're here, the worse, the, worse the, uh, the actual outcomes are. So my point is that things are not working the way they should work. We need to change it. And investing a bit of money today um, allows us to make that, those, those changes that are necessary, I believe, in order to build a better Ontario. Because, you know, if you think those, those issues don't affect you as a white male, oh, perhaps living out here, they do. Absolutely. We're speaking to Michael Couteau. Uh, Mr. Couteau is the Minister for Children's Services and Anti-Racism. We encourage you to pipe in uh, facebook.com forward slash Michael Couteau, and you can post your question. Let's go to our first questions from Melanie. Melanie asks, when are you going to fill families in on the new Ontario Autism Program? Everyone has been stressed to the max, wondering what is next? Next. Uh, and is this, is this Melanie? This is Melanie. The initial Melanie. launch, the initial la liberal uh, government launch in autism was unfortunately not particularly successful. So you have had to be the guy to show us the new light. And there are some interesting things that are afoot. Uh, how would you answer Melanie's question when you're going to fill the rest of the I made a here? commitment uh, that I would bring forward a new plan this right. year. So doing the math, I've probably got about four weeks left, so it'll be within the next four weeks. Oh, but you've done some good stuff. You've right. changed a lot of the bad stuff. I mean, you heard. You heard loud and clear from people who, uh, autism. You, you heard loud and clear about services. You heard about assisted, all those things. I went right across the you province. Did. I spoke to people, and there were a few things that came uh, forward. They said, uh, Michael, um, you know, do not um, place a child into a program based on their age or cut them off from a program. You know, make sure that... Uh, parents have the choice where they can actually spend the money, so a direct funding option. Mm -hmm. um, no more in and outs of programs. Kids are going constantly to be reassessed, reassessed. Keep them in the program. And um, the other thing was to have a um, an entry, single point of entry so it's not confusing for parents because, you know, when you have a young person who's being diagnosed with autism as a parent, in most cases, you won't have the expertise to know what the best choices are, right? Yeah. So to get that single point of entry, build the services around that young person and support that family and that's exactly what we're going to do. There was a, there was a lady in uh, Toronto, her name was Paula Stamp, she um, has an annual uh, event that's called Under the Big Top. Uh, she has a son, CJ, uh, who has autism and she raises funds for research and, and works with Autism Speaks. That woman is such 
a trailblazer. And there's so many times that Paula has been on here and I've heard her speak and I've heard the people from Autism uh, Speaks, which is their organization. Uh, I didn't want to wear their button today because that would be unfair to no, you. No, no, I think that so, would have been great. No, but I'm, I'm saying that to if yeah. Paula's watching. But the, but the scenario is they need to hear a clear message. Autism right. now is more of an affliction than we have ever known, and it is increasing. Uh, is there a time frame that you're going to make a formal acknowledgement and announcement so they so can get So in direction? June, I made the announcement saying these yeah. are the principles that I'll build yes. the program. I also said that um, there was a two-year plan to bring um, autism services, the new program, in. Mm -hmm. I cut that in half, so I said I'll do it within one year when I was first put into the position. Give me a couple more weeks, and I believe that we'll have a plan that will be brought forward that will make parents uh, in this province very happy. Good, I thank you for that. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll make sure you get a press release. Thank you, I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, Jennifer says, what are the government's plans to support children in care, especially around suicide prevention and programming? Suicide prevention right. and opioids, you know, that's right is, in your bailiwick, this is, right? This is, this is tough, right? It's, um, you know, when you have a young person who um, has mental health challenges, um, you know, it, um, you know, obviously affects that young person, but it affects the family, it affects the friends, uh, it affects an entire community. Um, you know, we need to make sure as a society that um, we have the options in place for parents and for families and for young people to get the help when they need it. Uh, right now, if you have a, um, a, a severe mental health challenge, it takes two to three days to get services, which to me is still too long. And if it's less severe, it can take two to three months. Um, we need to do a better job to get young people the services they need. Five years ago, um, we invested an additional $100 million um, to start a program called Moving on Mental Health. It was a strategy, mm -hmm. and it's to coordinate the services uh, for mental health, um, uh, those who use mental health services. Um, and we put these lead agencies across the province. In Toronto now, we have, a, for example, lead agency that is working with probably about 45 different organizations that provide uh, services to better coordinate those services. We had... Have you got some data back? Oh, we're getting a lot. We, we've, put, uh, we've put them in place, these lead agencies. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that um, our job now is to create that single point of entry. Um, could you imagine having a mental health, um, you know, scare or challenge as a family? And there's 45 organizations serving one community. And you don't even know where to go. There's no clarity. Mm. There's no single point of entry. So we're doing that. And um, I've always committed um, that Moving on Mental Health will look at the funding formula. So for me, it's important to make sure that, you know, as we move on mental health, uh, the final phase um, is making sure the resources are there for young people as Mr. well. Mr. Couteau, you have a challenging portfolio. I mean, if you think... First of all, anti-racism, that is, that is a huge nut in itself. And you, you, you talk about uh, youth and child services, such a broad topic, and right. you just bring in that small sliver of autism, <clears throat> and that is a huge piece. It's a very important piece. Well, you, you got a lot of... Child, uh, child protection, so children's aid societies, complex yeah. special needs. Um, you know, How many on your staff? Um, in the ministry? Yeah, for you. Under for you, under for you me, as like, yeah. so um, we have uh, 13 staff at the <sighs> ministry. Um, What's your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge? You know, my biggest challenge is that in this day and age in politics, um, it's not like the Bill Davis days where it was just growing so quickly, the economy, where there was so much money you could build infrastructure, schools. You know, we have, it as you go. We haven't raised taxes, personal income taxes, besides the health tax. Um, there's not been a provincial, um, uh, a provincial uh, tax on, uh, on salary. Uh, since probably the NDP was well, in power. Harris didn't do it, we, we didn't we do it. We don't want to talk about deficit. I want to concentrate. I no, but to, this I, is I, my point. There's the, there's more pressure in the system than yeah. ever before. And and the revenue is only growing through the economy's growth, not through I people wanting to pay more such taxes. such a challenging portfolio. So the biggest challenge is, at the end of the day, is there's so many good causes out there. Where do you prioritize? Mm. And the biggest challenge I have is saying, we're going to do this over this. And sometimes... Um, you know, it's uh, it's a hard thing to do. But that's my job as a minister, to look at the resources and figure out where they're going to be best spent. Ironically, the first uh, ministerial position you had, you were one of 10 people uh, who had no ministerial experience before. So you brought a fresh 
an innovative perspective to a ministry where many previous ministers were sub and were a deputy, etc. So you came in as a newbie, as one would say, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm going to go to Jennifer. Jennifer says, what are the government's plan to support children's care? A specific, oh, we already did that. I'm sorry. Carrie said, um, what about the direct funding options for young people with autism, and when, when are the details going to be released? Will you partially answer Carrie, that? Carrie, um, um, those, uh, well, we committed to direct funding back in June, um, but we will, um, I will have a plan that will come forward in the next few weeks that I believe you're going to be very happy with, and we made a commitment to direct funding, and that's the direction we're going in, so I think you'll be quite happy with that, uh, that plan. So I'm going to preface this question. I'm going to read the question because we don't, uh, we don't um, uh, doctor any of the questions. Uh, there is a side here in the Peel region which is two sides. One side says, in the law in Canada, you have to wear a, a helmet when you ride a motorcycle because if you get in an accident, our free health care will take care of you. There's another side that says, you are uh, doing a challenge to the Charter of Rights because you're not allowing me as a Sikh man to be able to wear my turban and not wear a motorcycle helmet. Uh, one side says that it is racist because uh, a community is forcing a devout religious person to take off a religious um, uh, headgear, which for them is is legitimate to their religion, where another is saying, if you choose to ride a motorcycle, you got to wear a helmet. So the question here right. is, the question here is, uh, Steve asks, what do you think about letting Sikh motorcycle drivers being able to drive their bikes without helmets? And this fits into the anti-racism thing because right. it's kind of in that discussion <clears throat> platform. Well, you know, I, I've heard the Premier speak to this issue. Um, and one of her responses she made once is that she's not going to be responsible to, to look at a parent who's lost a young person because of a head injury, um, you know, who's driven a motorcycle without the right safety precautions. And um, I, I agree with her. I agree that, you know, the risk is so strong, like to, you know, have someone, um, you know, on a road uh, at that speed without um, the safety precautions. You know, that's a uh, that's a big thing to ask, um, you know, a politician to um, to permit through legislation or but the one side says, I am a Sikh. Right. I take that risk upon myself because my devotion to my religion states that I cannot right. remove this from my head. But because of your restriction of my religious beliefs, I'm not able to ride a right. motorcycle. You know, Someone I, else takes your position and says, that. "Oh, I get I it too." Where that you shouldn't ride from. a motorcycle. I understand where they're coming from, and um, you know, the Sikh community has been very, um, very proactive on this issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand. I get where they're coming from. I think in British Columbia there is an yeah, exemption. and I think there's two Manitoba, I think, and or Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. British Columbia, I think it is two, if I recall. Yeah. From, and it's interesting because it's a pop-up question. But so, so how do you do, you see you have to so wear two hats. When right? you have when you have that <clears throat> when no you pun have intended. when yeah, <laughs> when you have that kind of um, decision to make, and both decisions have very valid points, um, you just have to go with the one that um, you know that you're that resonates stronger with you. I think that if you um, went into the legislature today and asked people to vote on that. I believe that the status quo would be maintained. Um, but, but at the same time, I don't know. I don't know where we go from here because there are some very valid points. And I understand what, uh, what folks are advocating for. And um, it's one of those questions that is going to constantly come up in the future. Um, the comment from Jennifer after listening to your response says, it sounds like you're still committed to supporting families, continue to commit to programs for parents and caregivers, kids and families need capacity. Yeah, we're, we've, um, so the, the, this, I'm assuming this is around uh, autism services, yes, right? Yes, uh, uh, Jennifer yeah. asked the question previously about uh, autism. She said, yeah. that, what is the government's plans to support children in care specifically around suicide prevention and programming? Oh, so is this about so is this about me this mental is health suicide Jennifer. or yes? Okay. I believe that's the same Jennifer. So yeah, we're we're a hundred percent committed to making sure that young people get what they need to uh, to find success here in the province of Ontario. You know, as Ontarians, I think we need to be really proud of the fact that at the end of the day, we spend probably the largest. If you looked at one demographic, young people receive the most benefits. You know, our education system, twenty three billion dollars. You know. Uh, uh, adv well, colleges and university, I think it's around 13 billion. You know, my ministry's 5 billion. You know, the new pharmacare program. 
Um, all of these things, you know, there's a strong commitment to help as a society to all of us pooling our resources and raise strong, resilient young people. Um, so, you know, this government has made a huge commitment to support families, to support um, kids. And, um, you know, I'm proud of our record, but I know we, we have further to go. Uh, you can put your fa your questions in and speak to Minister Couteau at facebook.com forward slash Michael Couteau. That's Couteau at K-O-T-E-A-U. Mr. Couteau is C-O-T-E-A-U. What did I, I say? C-O-T-E-A-U. Thank you. Yeah. Why did I put a K in there? Oh, that's <laughs> phonetic, phonetic, phonetically. Phonetic. Phonetic. <laughs> uh, but you pronounce it well, so thank, thank you. Well, je parle un peu, un peu de français, mais c'est oh. That's good. So, um... Uh, we're just waiting for a couple more questions coming. I'm going to ask you about the TVSB. Right. Uh, there was a, a situation where uh, they were uh, the RSO, the um, uh, being able to put police officers in schools to be able to have them integrate with students and to act as a resource officer. Um, the TVSB, Toronto District School Board, just uh, passed uh, a motion that removed, after 10 years now, 45 police officers from uh, uh, public schools. And uh, I, can, I can reiterate the percentages. The, the percentage was that there was more people who felt safe. There was a group of racialized uh, community that felt uh, that um, some of their students were being looked at or observed or... Uh, felt uncomfortable. Um, that is at probably the forefront or the heart of anti-racism because one right. would say there is a contingent that says police officers should be in the schools and should be integrated and, and should uh, be able to uh, work with the students and another contingent who says you got cops looking over my kids because they think they're guilty right how do you how no, do you I think it's I think it's a sad state of affairs where we have to have an armed officer in a school. Um, you know, think about that as a reflection of our society. In the United First States, they have to go through a metal detector. Right. We and, don't have and that, that yet. And, and thank God we don't have that. But, you know, I understand where the police are coming from. They want to protect people in our society. And I know, I, I've known some of those uh, resource, resource officers, officers yeah. that have been in the schools. And these are great people. Um, I've, I've worked with them. I was a trustee from 2003 Many of them are visible minorities. Absolutely. Specifically put in there to connect to the youth. But I'll tell you, me personally, Michael Koto, I, um, I don't know if I feel comfortable having a, a person um, with a gun, uh, a, you know, very visible gun in uh, my daughter's school. I just think for her to be in that, the presence of that type of image every day, um, you know, could have a negative effect on her. Um, but at the same time, I've spoken to people in different parts of Toronto um, where uh, the school resource officer was a positive aspect of their community. Um, those numbers that you showed me earlier, the 57% of yep. people feeling comfortable, um, you know, that's probably, you know, all of the schools combined. I'd love yes. to see it, how it would break down from school to school, because I don't think it creates a very clear picture because you can have a school resource officer in a community where that person is amazing and that person is loved and they're you know helping young people then you could have someone where they feel as though it's a you know the, the police state where they're constantly being monitored you know where they feel that like it's a negative like and it really depends on Isn't it our aspiration to right. be able to say in many of those uh, racialized communities many of the immigrants come from countries where the police were not their friend Right. where the police were corrupt, where talking to the police just made problems, cost you money, and got you into more trouble, whether you were a victim or you were the assailant. Either way, right. so it was bad. Is it not the objective to be able to inject the police icon and what they represent to serve and protect and to be able to assimilate them with students so they understand that the cop's not a bad person. The cop's there for you so instead there, of observing you. So you have to remember this, that there's been some, you know, <clears throat> some really high profile cases with interaction between police and the black community and other communities yep. where it's not being very positive, right? Yep, I went into a community true. a few weeks ago, Dixon community, you know, great community. They've had, I believe what they told me was 15 murders um, this year of young people in their community, mostly young men. Um, and, you know, I asked them, well, what do we need to go forward? And they said the, one of the big challenges they have, and I'm not pinning this on police because, you know, police, you know, they're, they're, they're good and bad in every, absolutely. But, but they said but. one of the biggest challenges they have is that 
they have such a bad relationship with police officers. You know, they break down the doors. There's no communication with the the parents. The you know, they they come into the building, and you know, I think there needs to be a reconciliation between you know um, communities, some communities, and police officers, because some people feel that the presence there is um, is not having a positive effect on the general people. Now, don't get me wrong. They're there to serve and protect. Their job is to keep people safe. I understand that. But at the same time, it's important that any government service, that there's a, a, a relationship that happens uh, between people of trust. These are tax dollars, right? So, you know, I but think... If you talk to a cop, I don't want to belabor this point because this yeah, is yeah, one... Yeah. But if you talk to a cop who works in that area, right. he'll give you a perspective from his perspective. And it's very different. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's worthy of a, of a, of a show unto well, itself. Well, and my, my, my opinion when asked previously about this is that I think um, you need to look at communities and talk to people in the community about what they want for each community because there are some communities that completely disagree with it. There may be some communities and I've heard from teachers, I've heard from parents that, um, you know, from some in certain areas that they actually had a good thing going on. So just to uh, to create a... Um, you know, a one-stop kind of solution. Catholic School Board is still maintained. Right. They're police officers or resource officers and so right. have many others. L let's move on. Yeah. I think that's a... What about uh, free tuition? When we talk about um, education, I mean, that really is the key to unlock unlocking the door right. to uh, knowledge, equality, jobs, uh, the ability to, to write and apply, right. etc. When you talk about an education and free education in Ontario, uh, where is your government at with that? You know, I um, you know, the fact that I'm here today was because I had the ability to access an OSAP program. Um, you know, it took me a long time to pay it back. It was about fifty six thousand I owed at the very end, um, and um, you know, I have no regrets. Um, but I think that um, you know, if I could uh, get through school and participate within the economy at a quicker pace, you know, I think I could have contributed. You know, be a homeowner earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best investment we can make as you know, as people who are aging is in our young people, so you we can... talking to me? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> you talking to me? As we are aging. Sorry. <laughs> you notice I kept both of us that, in the mix there. That was there. very good. I thought that was um, very nice. But, you know, as we're aging, we want to make sure that we continue to build a diverse workforce that's knowledge-based. Yep. And, you know, investing in our young people to get that type of education is only going to come back tenfold. But they need a little skin in the game, right? Yeah. Don't you think, uh, although it's one thing to say that we want to offer a free education, as soon as someone's got a little skin in the game, it's worth a bit more well, for when them you to get, participate. When, right? when you get free tuition, that doesn't mean that your, you know, your housing is going to be paid for, your books are going to be paid for. It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, your food's going to be paid for. It's your tuition. Right. So you go off to university, yeah. there's a bit of a sacrifice. Or you go off to college, there's a big decision that's made and your lifestyle adjusts. And you do have to have skin in the game. It's, you know, there's a little financial skin, yeah. but even more so, you got to complete Commitment. the work. You got to do it, you know. So, you know, I, I'm completely comfortable with making sure that young people in this province, regardless of their economic status, have the ability to go to post-secondary. So uh, did you get the chance? Did I get the chance? Uh, yes, I did. I, I paid for my own education. Excellent. Uh, I, I worked. I was fortunate that I had family in Europe. So right. I, I took summer school, not because I had to. I took summer school because I, I took geography and history ahead of time wow. so that I graduated ahead so I could take off my last a portion of grade 13 that just goes to show you how old I am. So I, I, could, so, I had 13 too. So, so I could go, go to another country and, and study a language. So I was given a great opportunity. That's awesome. Um, and it was it was through the grace of Ontario that I was able to educate. I'm a I'm a professional television producer. I produce a lot of sports, and that's an acumen that is uh, very specific and takes right. a lot. Um, uh, I want to talk about politics here because Pete's got a very interesting question. And I like Pete's question. Don't read Pete's question. Okay. Um, Sorry, Pete. <laughs> no, no. I, um, you look at the numbers now. I've had the opportunity, uh, and I and I mean this when I say an opportunity, to speak to our Premier, Madam uh, Kathleen Wynne, for an hour and uh, ask her very poignant and, and um, pointed questions. And... Um, she didn't skate on any of them. She answered them all. Uh, whether you agree or you disagree, it's still, uh, she sat here with me for an hour and answered the questions. Currently, the, the Liberal government coming up to an, an election in 2018, your numbers are, are pretty tough. Right. Uh, you're in the 12 and 17 zone. So that's tough. Uh, and with an election coming up, either we've got to 
change or give or get the message. I mean, uh, Sousa came out with some good numbers, so you're working. What, what right. Pete's question is, he says, you seem like a great guy, very personable. What's your message to voters who want to vote for you but don't like the premier? Well, <laughs> Um, that's a horrible question. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, Tough. no, that's, uh, that's, that's great. It's Pete, Politics. right? Yeah, Pete. You know, well, first of all, um, people may not like the premier that, you know, you just said the numbers, they may not like her, <clears throat> but I know the pr premier personally. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Flemington park, which she represents. Yep. Um, so I have a lot of respect for her. Um, I've seen her in action prior to being in politics myself. And I can say that she's someone who has values and um, and I think she's heading in the right direction. But um, I think people like Pete have to ask themselves the question, you know, where are we today versus, you know, where we were, you know, a decade ago? You know, where are we in comparison to other provinces or internationally? We know we have the lowest unemployment um, in, in 16 years. We have um, the best uh, GDP in the G20. Um, we have, uh, our economy is on fire. If Ontario is just incredible, the amount of growth that's taking place. Um, we haven't raised personal income tax as a government. Um, we've uh, brought forward free t tuition. We've brought forward Pharmacare for so anyone Pete under should, 25. Should Pete, Pete should vote for the Liberals because it's not because he doesn't like the Premier. It's because they're, they're setting us on the right track. I think the direction the Premier has brought us, he may not personally like her, but I, when you put her policies up against any, like we've balanced the budget. The Conservatives came out with their platform well, this that's, weekend. Well, that's a, that's a tenuous issue, balance No, the it is. It, there's not, this is, a, there's a balanced budget. You know, we went from in 2009 a $19 billion deficit. We decided to go and invest in, you know, healthcare, education. We built schools. We took a, a very, um, uh, it was a very um, thought out decision to, to go into a deficit position to fight the recession. We were able to build this city, this province, the GTA over that, you know, several years, and we landed in a nice place. Um, you know, well, okay. when, well, when I Mike... have to challenge you there, we're in a nice place. There are other countries who have gone into a condition of austerity. Right. Our nice place is that we are the second largest sovereign debt in the world behind California. But you have there to look at There are some people that, that say <clears throat> spending $40 million a month on interest is a pretty tough nut. But you have to also keep in mind that if you look at our GDP in the province of Ontario and our GDP to debt, which, you know, it sounds like... You know, who focuses on GDP to debt? But when you take our GDP and you analyze it across our debt and you start to do those equations, it looks like a very different picture. We may have more debt, but our capacity to pay that debt, pay that debt. exceeds okay. most jurisdictions. So let me flip the question to you. What about the announcements that the Conservatives just did right now? If you're talking to Pete when you're looking what the Conservatives uh, announced their platform, uh, we're still waiting for the Liberals to come out with theirs. It's a, it's a tactical thing. I get that. Right. The Conservatives just did the big, uh, big announcement. What's your appraisal of uh, what they've announced? You know... I don't think Patrick Brown and Conservatives can be trusted. When Patrick Brown was part of the Harper government, um, the economy, um, they ran the largest deficit in the history of this country. I believe um, it was a $55 billion deficit, um, number one. And, they, you know, Conservatives will tell you that, you know, they're, you know, they like to manage the economy well, but they, they ran the largest deficit ever. You know, Mike Harris, when he was in power, ran a deficit in the best of economic times. So they cut services and continued to um, run deficits. You know, the best example Ontarians can think of when it comes to the legacy of conservative rule in this province is, you know, the selling of the 407. You know, they took an asset that cost a hundred and- Careful, you, know, you want me to bring the word hydro in but, and then we I have want, a real but discussion I want, here. But I want you to listen to this for a second. Huh? The 407, according to Hansard at the at Queen's Park, the 407, the, the, the right for that land, the right of way for that land, yeah, yeah. it's a hundred billion dollar expenditure. It's owned by Austrians now, isn't so, it? So, but listen to this, a hundred, it costs Ontarians a hundred and, and, and four billion dollars. The value of the company at the time was valued at nine billion dollars. What did the Conservatives sell that, that, that asset for? $3 billion. That generates half a billion dollars every single year. So how do you justify the sale of Ontario Hydro? So Ontario Hydro, we, we own um, the largest majority still. You've got 40% out 40%, already. so we're the largest shareholder, Ontarians. Mm -hmm. We've leveraged the company to be more efficient. 
Um, the, um, the money that was taken from it has been invested into infrastructure. We know, I drove around this neighborhood today, you, we have a congestion issue in the GTA. You know, the Conference Board of Canada says that, um, you know, the congestion in the GTA costs us about $5 billion a year. The more we invest into infrastructure, the more we free up the economy, the increase in production. So just because you take an asset and move it to another asset doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Now, I know that most Ontarians would disagree with the, the sale of hydro. We've heard it loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think that when you compare what we've done, it was based on a, a, an opportunity. It's seeking an opportunity and still retaining the largest share, uh, shares of hydro. When you compare it to what a conservative government did to this province, $104 billion uh, expenditure to build this thing for the right of way. 407. $9 billion asset on paper and sold for $3 billion. To me, that's highway robbery. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of meat on that discussion there. There's um, on, on both ways. I'll go to Catherine. Catherine says she she apologizes for the long question. She says, Canada has a history of government programs like CAS, which is the Children's Aid Society, which have removed racialized children from their families. What more can be done now and going forward to support families as units, to partners with parents, to partner with parents to build networking and parenting skills instead of punishing children for life? What an interesting question. Right. That's right in, like, that's your wheelhouse. That's a poignant question, right? We, we touched on it before when we were talking about um, uh, Ontario Children's Aid. Yeah. Um, there's no question in my mind the best way to view a community or a society to see if it's actually doing well is to just look at how well the children are doing. And um, we've, um, you know, we've made some massive gains when it comes to uh, children in care. You know, in Toronto, I know the number of children in care has dropped uh, by half uh, over the last few years. So we have fewer, fewer kids in care. Um, but um, we need to make it easier for young people to find, you know, a loving family, to uh, become adopted. So we've made investments as a ministry to make sure that, you know, there's um, uh, places for young people to go. Like, for example, connecting to a family member. Uh, by supporting young people when it comes to uh, working with agencies that do adoption. So we work with like um, um, Adoption Ontario and provide them services. The question here is more about not removing children from right. families, right. but supporting, uh, instead of saying that you walk and you see that there needs to be nourishment, there's not sufficient care, instead of removing the child from the family, um, from the family situation and planting that child somewhere else, right. how do you work with the parents and work with the family unit to be able to sustain the child within that family unit instead right. of removing them? So we put forward um, we put forward some new legislation here in the province of Ontario, Bill 89, that I believe uh, changes uh, the largest changes ever in the history of this province when it comes to children and care. It's um, you can't take. OK, so we know that young people have been removed uh, from families because there hasn't been enough food in the house. Yeah, me. That's unacceptable. You know, you remove a, a, a couple of kids. Wait a second. What's unacceptable? The fact that they've been removed from the home. No, so, it's a, no, I, I disagree. It's unacceptable that there's not enough food for the child. That's unacceptable. We agree. So my point so, is, my point is, why are you removing a child from a home where that child is loved, but there's not enough food coming in? Why not go to look for the root of the problem? Why is that happening? Put food in the fridge, and they want to smoke, and they want to have uh, cable TV. Maybe the parent has suffered an injury at work, has lost that job, is a single parent. Um, we, we've seen yeah. we've seen um, young people removed because of things like that. Um, you know, this for me, this question still comes down to the root of, of, of okay, an organization was... removing children from a family. Right. We need to be able to help that parent to say this is why you have to have this kind of food. If your child doesn't have breakfast, no, in the morning, I think what that question is saying is that um, you know we we it's not as black and white as it is as as in some cases. Like for example, there was this um, lady, this grandmother who had. Um, I believe it was two or three children that came into her care. Um, in her house, there was a renovation going on that she couldn't afford to continue paying for. There was wires sticking out. So if CIS comes in, they say, wait a minute, this is not very safe. Let's remove the kids from mm -hmm. that scenario. Rather than removing those children from the scenario that ends up costing taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars It would have cost month, to put an electrician in there to send cap someone all the into thousand dollars and fix the house. It's the same thing with the food issue. Rather than removing but a child, someone would say, "Someone would say, although that is a great solution." Someone would say, 
they're not responsible for finishing the renovation of the house. They should only be responsible, if at best, for making it a safe environment for right. a child to be able to exist. Well, in, if right? a grandmother all of a sudden has three children at her doorstep and she can't afford to pay for that renovation, what should we do in that situation? Should we let those children go into care or should we help that grandmother uh, be best positioned to look after those children, so, which will cost I mean, the system 90% less, and it's the right thing to do. But the system says that you are to protect the children, correct? Right. That, that's it. The uh, the malfeasance of the grandmother to, uh, to uh, instigate a uh, renovation that she couldn't afford or was wrong is a mistake on her part. But if it's a dangerous scenario, then those children shouldn't be so there, let so me, they should let be me ask, Let me ask you the question. You're the head of the CAS. Um, you can spend $1,000 to keep kids uh, in the house with their grandmother who loves them uh, because something's happened to the mother. So the grandmother stepped up and it's going to cost $1,000 to maybe do some renovations or do you put those children into care? So I'm head of the CAS, you're the media guy. Okay, right. let's just switch for a sec. So if I go and I say, <laughs> and I say it's absolutely, this is an exception to the rule, we're going to cap those wires and just do whatever we have to do to make that uh, renovation go so we can keep the three kids there. You're going to come to me and said, Michael, yeah. how dare that the public is going to make renovations to do that? You're, it's, a, it's, it's almost... Hey, you know what? I'll tell you this right you now. You... I'll, I'll tell you this right now that um, if the media is going to criticize me, if the public is going to criticize me uh, because I've decided to keep a kid... Uh, with a grandparent, that's a great response. Uh, then um, I you wish know, I would have thought of that. If then, I was then you know, that's 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 good but criticism it's an because it's an, I fear, but I hear where you're coming it's from. An you're exception asking of a rule. questions. It's yeah. an exception of a rule. I, I get that. And it, sometimes, um, if we worked on uh, the basis of what made sense, we would get a lot farther. The problem is, is that there are always people out there who are gaming the system. Right. And. If we make one exception, you're right. You're absolutely right. So how do we? You see, we come back to the same thing. I think what the question, what the question was, was how do we keep kids who are in danger with their families? And it's not the kids' fault. Right. It's not their responsibility to go grocery shopping. It's the parents' fault. It's right. their responsibility. How do we educate them and get them to say, you know what? Maybe, maybe you got to get rid of the cable because it's more important to have milk and at least a box of cereal. Yeah, and you know what? There's no question in my mind that, um, you know, when we talk about parenting in the province of Ontario, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, people can do a better job in many, many cases, but there are a lot of good parents out there and a lot of good people yeah. who want to look after, um, you know, either a sibling or a relative. And, um, you know, if they need a little bit of help to do that and it ends up costing me less, and I know that that child's in a loving environment, um, you know, to me, that's always the better yeah. option. Uh, Jan, Abaz, uh, Jan Bazian says, way to go, Michael. Your government is doing a great job. Huh. Uh, Tanya writes, we have been told about 100,000 new children's spaces are being made available. Are there any plans for those children uh, care spaces to be made affordable? Child care is expensive, even for some through subsidized programs. Right. So the whole point of um, uh, Minister Nadu Harris's uh, uh, plan to bring forward um, 100,000 more child care spaces is to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, they remain uh, affordable and accessible to parents. So it is a subsidy program. Um, and um, our hope is that at the end of the day, um, you know, people will access that program and they'll be able to save some money. Uh, you're watching uh, Face, uh, not Facebook, like Live Town Hall. <laughs> My name is Michael Charbon. We're here with Michael Couteau, who is the Minister of Child Services and Anti-Racism. You can go to Facebook.com, Michael Couteau, that's C-O-T-E-A-U, forward slash. Uh, we'll take your questions. Uh, Mr. Couteau has been here graciously answering all our questions, and you're doing a good job. Oh, you're, thank you. You're handling it all. It's all, it's all <laughs> wonderful. Um, when you look at what we're going to be faced with um, with respect to uh, anti-Islamic uh, Islamophobia, right? Um, in the region of Peel, we have probably the highest concentration of visible minorities of, of anywhere. Fifty-seven percent, I heard today. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge, and uh, we have a, a very active uh, Islamic community who do many great things for many people, uh, and they are part of our community, and uh, we work with them, and they work with us. There is, unfortunately. Uh, a little bit of a different position for our neighbors to the south. They seem to take a little bit more of a harsher point of view. Um, there are others also in this country who say we have to be more vigilant. Uh, we have to be uh, careful. How do you, 
How do you deal with that? Because you're dealing with people's religion. You're dealing with newcomers who are already, in a certain instance, ostracized because they look different right. and are different. And you try to assimilate them and you try to say to people that you can't be afraid of these folks. But others would say they watch the news, they hear what it is. How do you deliver you know, that I, message? I spoke to, uh, I spoke to an older gentleman um, about uh, his experience as a newcomer here in Canada. And, um, you know, he's talking to me about how, you know, when they go to the corner, the police would harass them. Um, that, you know, anytime they kind of assembled in a group that they, you know, um, were uh, criticized and, and threatened. That, you know, people would, um, you know, constantly uh, throw derogatory terms uh, to them. And um, it was interesting because this was an Italian guy who came here back in the 1950s, right? And you look at Italians today in this province and you see them as they've done so much. A million plus Italians here in Ontario. They've helped build this province. Mm -hmm. You know, they're business leaders. Um, you know, I was looking at the uh, Business Canada top 50 rich people and a lot of them Italians on the list. You know, they've just done an incredible job. But remember, they were met with suspicion. They were harassed. Yep. You know, they were discriminated against. Doesn't so, it take, would you say, would you say, can I give you a premise? It takes about two generations. Well, the first this, generation comes over and their kids of the first generation look odd and are odd because they follow what their parents did. Right. Their kids are going to school as born and raised here, no, no different of the old country. Right. And by that time, they're already in the zone. Dad, listen, you gotta be cool. It's not like this anymore. After two generations, it's the melting pot. Doesn't matter but, where you but, are. But it goes back are we to a my, generation away it from go, that? It goes back to my original point, and this is one of the initial discussions we had. When you look at black, uh, black people here in Ontario, in, more specifically in the GTA, the longer they stay here, generation-wise, the worse they end up. So it's interesting. So going back to your original point, it should take one or two, three generations. Two to get, generations. It should take two generations to really integrate. But for some reason, it's not happening within the black community. Remember, the black community, um, a little bit of a different narrative than, a than a most immigrants, right? I have right? a problem with that statement. We have No, we this have is a not black, a statement. This is a fact. We have a black police chief. We had a black president in the United States. We had <laughs> you're, you're a colored gentleman. We have, we have, we have, with all due respect, we have a lesbian premier. Yeah. I mean, and there's, uh, and there's nothing wrong with any of it. We yeah. have black pride. We have black, I'm not, I'm not black history month. But when not, when do not, we not, say we're good? I'm not talking, this is not a statement. I'm giving you statistics, facts from the Toronto District School Board's disaggregated race-based data. Disaggregated race-based, <laughs> disaggregated. Oh my God. This is, these are facts. A, this is what. It's so, a political term, disaggregated race-based So based the race-based data that we're. I like uh, you. I think you're a good guy. <laughs> the race-based data we're talking about the school board, you know, they do a survey every few years. Years, and they um, they look at income, they look at background, immigration patterns, they look at everything. They find that uh, uh, third generation black boys, mainly from the Caribbean, every generation seem to be doing worse. So my point is going back to it should take two generations. It should take three generations. Who knows? It one should take generation. One of, yeah, one. Why, why isn't it happening for that community? Right. So that's the point. So, you know, sorry to bring us back to the original point of the conversation, <laughs> but... At the end of the day, um, there's a cost to standing still. And that kid who's not getting that opportunity uh, for some reason, and not maybe not even get, it's not even about getting the opportunity. That young person who's not taking advantage of that opportunity that this great province has to offer for certain reasons, you know, it's, it will affect you, it will affect me, it affects society as a whole, because there's a cost to all of us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up a, a word in the United States which is called affirmative action. Right. It was a motion that said, that a university had to have a proportional representation of black people within their uh, student constituents. Uh, otherwise, they were not being fair and giving uh, right. ample opportunity. Uh, the two sides of that affirmative action was that those who got to that school because they had the grades and because they did it were looked upon as lesser and were looked upon as you were given a break just because you're black. Right. And it is absolutely unfair. And to some extent, some people would say it's done more damage than good. Right. If we try to social engineer, we're just doing we're just doing affirmative action in the same way, are we not? Do you think we have affirmative action in this province? Uh, Does it sound like you think it's happening? I, I think there is a level of there is a, a level of corporate 
uh, acknowledgement that there has to be uh, a representation of their corporate um, uh, presentation to public which reflects the community that they serve and the constituents who invest in them. And the problem I see is we shouldn't base it on the color, we should base it on the merit. Where we get into the gray areas, what is the the ability to give opportunity to those to excel? There, I am I understand. Yeah, I, well, first of all, we don't have affirmative action in, uh, in Canada. I don't believe we do. I've never, I know it's not in Ontario. I know that there was uh, employment equity that was brought forward by the NDP back in the 90s. You know, it was very controversial, if mm -hmm. you can remember. Um, I think that if you're a business in Ontario and you don't look for ways to diverse your workforce, oh, you're, 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 you're going to miss out. And the drivers to, um, you know, the drivers to any business is always going to be capitalism. Like you're going to make more money if you do the right thing. I'll tell you this, you know, Ontario, with the diversity we have, we should be the place where people are coming to strike those deals so we all benefit. And uh, we've, got the, uh, we've got the population and the diversity to do that. Uh, two more questions here. I have a follow-up to that. Okay. But I'm going to do these first. Jean-Pierre says, which government vote during your time in office do you regret the most? <laughs> do I regret the do most? Do you regret the most? Which, uh, which vote in government do you regret the most? Jean Pierre, that's a that's a toughie. I don't know. Well, regret. I don't. I don't. Yeah, because this is the thing, right? You, let's be honest. You may not, you may not agree with everything your party is doing. That's a fact. But you know, a party uh, works. The party system works because you can get everyone moving in the same direction. That's what binds them together. They have their arguments internally. They debate it. You know, but um, it's the majority that move forward together. That's usually how it works. Um, I don't regret any of my my votes um, that I've ever uh, that I've ever been involved in. Um, you know, I wish maybe there are things that I could have done differently in regards to uh, you know bringing forward issues or taking advantage. But you of don't an regret a vote per se. Well, I don't know if I I can't think of one that That's I regret because at the, the end top. of the day, yeah. um, you know, even if I disagreed with it internally, it was part of like our party's agenda, right? Our government's agenda. Steve wants to ask: Do you think the province of Ontario should rename schools named after Sir John A. Macdonald? Uh, no. Um, Thank you. The reason why I say that <laughs> is because um, the reason why I say that is because um, you know, for example, McGill. Do you know he was a slave owner? No, but I mean, uh, so McGill was a slave owner. So the we the, learn by tearing the, down history, we we deprive we deprive those coming after us to acknowledge right. and to identify the wrongs that they did. So McGill was a slave owner. So yeah. the question becomes, well, should we change the, McGill, the yeah. name? So here's the thing. I just hope that we do such a good job in educating our young people mm -hmm. that when that black young woman who's going to McGill, bright eyed, ready to take on the world to become a doctor and is wearing that McGill sweater, yep. she knows the history. Yep. And then she has a choice to make. But, you know, to go backwards and to start removing um, names like Sir Johnny McDonald, yes. um, you know, I think it starts to strip away from, uh, you know, our, our history as a, as a country. And we can learn more from, I think when they took those, uh, when they took those statues in the States down, they should have said, instead of taking the statues down, they should have erected a plaque which explained who that person was because in that day and age, right. whether he paid for it or uh, he did benefit, not everything was good, but there was a different set of rules there. If we use our 2017 rule book back then, it doesn't work. But you know, the same thing, like, so we've got all these great, um, you know, statues of Sir John and McDonald. Yes. I would love to have a, a, a statue of William Hubbard. Do you know who that is? William Hubbard. 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 No, sir. The first acting, first black city councillor, I think it was like 1896 uh, in Toronto. He actually um, was... Um, why, don't you do that? why don't you do a Black History Month? Do something about that. And, I'm not and, talking about... I'm talking about... But that's a great thing. I'm talking about... So this guy yeah. was the acting mayor of Toronto. He's the guy who started Toronto Hydro. He was the first commissioner. And um, his Hubbard. story is he was, he was walking, a young guy walking along the Don River, George Brown in his carriage falls apparently into the river. This guy goes and helps save George Brown's life, who is an abolitionist. George Brown takes him under his wing and he becomes an alderman uh, back in the t at the turn of the century. Um, there's a great episode on Murdoch Mystery. And in fact, I said, they're gonna hate me for saying this, but 
the producer of Murdoch Mystery, I said to him, why don't you bring Murdoch, why don't you bring William Hubbard into the mix and tell that story? And he brought him in as a character. I don't know if it was because of me. That's fabulous. But, but I mean, let's no, but get, that's great. let's tell that's these positive. stories. And you know, Murdoch Mysteries for that organ, that company to do. He's pumping the CBC. You're, <laughs> you're a good liberal. You're pumping the CBC. Uh, you're watching Town Hall Live. My name is Michael A. Charbon. Uh -huh. Here with uh, Michael Couteau, who is the uh, Minister of Child Services and Anti-Discrimination. We've got about seven minutes left. We've I've got a couple of questions here left. Another autism question. Uh, Steve writes, do you think the province of... Aunt no, we already did that. Uh, well, there was one autism. Oh, yes. Concern that's Patrick and Carrie. Concerning autism and direct funding, uh, you've said families can expect an announcement within the next couple of weeks. How quickly can we expect this news to be actually implemented? How long does it take after you say we're going to do this that the government puts uh, cash in hand and rubber hits the road? Um, my expectation is that um, early in the new year, um, the program starts rolling out completely. Because there's there's lots of people in the autism I need, spectrum that need I need to start. Need int I need I need the intake uh, to start uh, uh, taking place as soon as possible. So we've got uh, we got about five minutes left. Um, I want to give you an opportunity uh, to speak to the folks direct. I think one of the right. most important um, avenues of of a live town hall like this is to give you an opportunity to talk to the people who elected you and talk to the people who consider you a representative of the government and let them know straight from the hip what's it all about. So yeah. I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to the folks and tell them what you're going to do, what you're doing, and, and why you're doing this. Why? Yeah. So th first of all, thank you, Michael, for having me on the show. Um, you know, this opportunity to come on and talk about issues, uh, you know, means a, a lot to me. And I just want to thank you for your time. But I think that... Um, you know, as Ontarians, we've got a good story to tell. You know, when we look around um, the world, um, there's a lot of bad things going on. You know, even looking down south, we see that they've, they're going through some serious challenges. You know, as Ontarians, um, you know, when we came into power as a government, 66% of young people were graduating high school. Are, uh, now we're at 86.5%. Uh, you know, we had the longest wait times in the entire country back in 2003. Today, we have the shortest wait times. Mm -hmm. You know, as Ontarians, we come together and we look after each other. And those are the values that I don't think are uh, reflected in all political parties. I believe that, you know, the Ontario Liberal Party uh, um, captures the essence of what it means to be an Ontarian and to support those values of, you know, a strong economy, a good health care system and a good education system. We need to build a province where a young person is given an opportunity, you know, to find themselves and to reach their full potential. And at the same time, it has to be a place where young people uh, and old people can grow and age, uh, you know, in a in a in a way that makes us proud as uh, as Ontarians. So, um, I believe that uh, going forward, um, as the parties start to uh, bring forward their platforms and they start to talk about their track record, um, I'd ask Ontarians just to think about where we were, where we are, and where we need to go, and how those values are aligned to that vision. Uh, when you look at the numbers of seats that are available, uh, the Ontario Legislature. Uh, the Liberals are in a minority, uh, in a majority, I should say. Right. Uh, when we look at the 2018 election, it's going to be a shorter election. Uh, there's going to be less funding available. Uh, there's going to be a fight this time. A big uh, fight. There's going to be a fight this time. Um, do you see one issue as uh, something that is going to be, uh, uh, how would one say, the issue that's going to make the difference? Is there well, an issue that you stand behind that, that's going to make a difference to make someone choose a, a Liberal over a Conservative? Well, I just because I think the NDP is going to be the the key holder of either right. you or the Conservatives. I think I think the big question is this: What type of province do we want to build? Do we want to build a province where it's every person for themselves, um, where you're basically on your own, and uh, you know, um, you know, you uh, deserve what you get because you deserve what you get? Or are we going to build a province where we collaborate, we build together, and we make sure we all move forward together? You know, that's the type of province I think that we've been able to build here, that we look after each other, we work with each other. You know, when someone falls a bit behind, we can help them up. Um, what type of province are we going to build? You know, Patrick Brown and the Conservatives this weekend put forward a proposal that has a $12.75 billion cut over four years. And this is on page 76. You can see it yourself. It's the bottom few lines. Where are those cuts going to come from? You know, where are we going to head as a province? Do we want to wake up one day 
and um, like a Harris government, see, you know, for example, you know, some of our most vulnerable people who are on social assistance or unemployment and people who have worked all their life, they're injured, you know, seeing a 33 or 34 percent cut to their, uh, you know, to their uh, their benefits. You know, person on social assistance getting 600 and change today. You know, we saw a, Har a Harris government make those cuts. I'm from the literacy sector. Um, you know, originally when I was uh, when I was uh, uh, running a not for profit organization, you know, I saw Patrick Brown and Stephen Harper cut twenty seven million dollars from literacy programs that help people to learn how to read adults. You know, what type of Ontario do we want to build? I believe that we need to continue to build an Ontario where we look after each other, where we help each other. And when a person gets sick, when they need a helping hand, when they need just a little bit of help, it's there for them. The Honourable Minister Michael Couteau, he is the Minister of Child and Youth Services and Anti-Racism. I thank you so much for being here Michael, today. Michael, thank you for You're your a time, good man. man. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're a very it. passionate speaker. We want to say thank you to Brampton Focus, to uh, Fazil Khan, to uh, Paul Vicente, Paul McLeod, and Cash and Joseph for making this happen. It is people like that that work for free and volunteer their time, as I do, to uh, make a live town hall uh, take place. We invite you to go to our Facebook page, post your questions, and a reminder that in December we're going to be talking to the two mayors of Peel Region. We're going to be talking to the Caledon mayor, uh, the um, Brampton mayor, and also to uh, an MP, Ruby Sahota. So we uh, look forward to uh, having you post your questions and participate in live town hall. My name is Michael A. Charbonne. It was a pleasure to be with you this evening, and thank you for your time. You can like us on Facebook and post your questions anytime. Thanks for watching.